Welcome everyone to the October installment of the CSAFE Fall 2022 webinar series sponsored by NIST. Today we have Handwriter, a demonstration and update on CSAFE handwriting analysis. Your speakers today are Drs. Alicia Caracchieri and Stephanie Reinders. Alicia is the Distinguished Professor and the President's Chair in the Department of Statistics at Iowa State University, and she also happens to be the Director of the Center for Statistics and Applications in Forensic Evidence, CSAFE. Stephanie has undergraduate degrees in multimedia and computer graphics, journalism, and Asian languages and literatures, and most recently earned her PhD in applied mathematics and computer engineering at Iowa State. She is now a research scientist for the Center for Statistics and Applications in Forensic Evidence. Alicia, with that, I will turn it over to you. So without further ado, this is our acknowledgments uh, uh, page. Uh, our, and our work is funded by, um, by NIST through a cooperative agreement. Uh, CSAFE is a center of excellence of NIST, and we collaborate pretty closely with them. And uh, as I started writing the collaborators for the handwriting project, this is a cast of thousands, actually. Turns out this is one of our largest projects, research projects at CSAFE. Uh, at Iowa State, uh, Drs. Danica Omen, whom most of you probably know, Dr. Stephanie Reinders uh, just introduced. Uh, we have several uh, graduate um, uh, associate students, um, Alexandra Arabio, Nick Berry, Amy Crawford, uh, Madeline Johnson, uh, Nick, Amy, Madeline graduated and are having a great life. Anisha Ray, Federico Veneri. We have undergraduates uh, working in this program, uh, Emily Allen, uh, others, uh, James Taylor was a, a, a programmer largely responsible for um, handwriter. James is now pursuing a master's at uh, the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. Gary Licht, our uh, great collaborator from the Iowa Department of Criminal Investigations. He's been with us since the beginning and has kind of kept us uh, honest to the best of his ability. Uh, everything uh, that we haven't done uh, following his uh, advice is our um, fault alone. Uh, Linton Mohammed has been a great collaborator as well. Linton is a, a, a board certified question document examiner uh, that operates out of um, Orange County in California. And of course, we have several collaborators at NIST, including uh, our uh, contract um, officer, uh, Robert uh, Romatowski. So um, here's an outline for the talk. Uh, I'll start describing a little bit what we do with handwriting, uh, handwriting and how we extract data from it. Uh, I'll briefly talk about decomposing writing into graph, graphs, uh, how we cluster gra uh, graphs, and uh, how we extract data from those graphs that we can then, uh, quantitative measurements, if you will, that we can then use to actually do some statistics. And then I'll talk briefly about what we call the closed set scenario, where uh, the, the, the situation is there's a group of potential writers of a document. Think, um, you know, a, a US government facility where all the uh, um, documents are classified, and there's been a threatening note, and you know that it has to be somebody from inside that facility who wrote that note. Um, and this is uh, the first type of work that we did uh, in the analysis of handwriting. Uh, I'll briefly discuss uh, a hierarchical model that we developed that does a very good job of estimating the probability of writership. And then I'm going to pass it to Stephanie, who will give you a demonstration of handwriter. And the reason I talk about this uh, stuff first is because at this moment, handwriter can do all of these things. All right, and then if there is time, I'll talk a little bit about the open set scenario. So this is where we go to likelihood ratios and uh, score-based likelihood ratios. And Danica, with one of her students, has been working on something really interesting, which is called ensemble methods. Uh, and I'll discuss, I'll describe it if I can in very non-technical uh, terms, just to give you an idea what this is all about. 
Okay, so writing, handwriting uh, appears as evidence uh, often, right? So this is through ransom and threatening notes, uh, signatures, suicide notes, all kinds of things. And uh, our focus on CSAFE has always been on the shape of the writing, the characteristics of the writing, not on the content. There's other uh, groups that work on the content of writing, finding um, the frequency of certain idioms and so on. We don't do that. We only look at the shape of the writing. Now, at present, uh, uh, question document examiners that are uh, pretty well trained um, compare perhaps two uh, samples of writing and they look at uh, class characteristics and individual characteristics of the writing. And among the class characteristics, uh, you can think of you know, overall writing patterns uh, that are similar for a group of people. You can always tell an architect, for example, by their handwriting, right? There is no question. Or, you know, international writers, I think I can almost always tell German people, other people that got their primary education in German. Uh, and then there's individual characteristics uh, that are attributes of the writing that are typical of a single person. For example, the slant of the writing, the connectedness of the letters um, and numbers, uh, and the shape of the loops uh, and so on. At the end of the day, uh, the conclusion that they reach is subjective and uh, categorical in the sense that uh, at present, uh, question document examiners use this scale, this ASTM scale that has various, um, various possibilities, right? All the way from identification to uh, elimination. So um, before, I, so as I mentioned briefly, um, at CSAVE, we consider two scenarios. One of them is the closed uh, versus, okay, so we consider two scenarios, which is the closed uh, versus the open set, uh, set of writers. Uh, the closed set of writers is really a classification problem. So like I said, you have a certain number of potential writers. You know that the author of a document has to be somebody from that group. And so the question is, can I associate the question document to one of those potential writers? Uh, the open set question is different, right? So this is where I have perhaps two samples of writing. Both of those may have unknown provenance. And I might ask myself, did those, was the same person writing these two documents? That would be a common source uh, question. But I could also have maybe a suspect from whom I have samples of writing uh, and a question document, and I might ask myself, did the suspect write this question document? That would be the specific source question. So again, I'll start with the open set, and then if there's time, I'll talk a little bit about the, sorry, the closed set, and if there's time, I'll talk about the open set situation. So our goal at CSAFE has been always to develop uh, accurate, uh, reproducible, quantitative methods for the forensic evaluation of handwriting uh, evidence in both scenarios. We don't mean to, um, nothing of what we are doing will ever um, do away with examiners. So everything that we present here is, um, you, you should think about it as additional tools uh, to help the examiner do their work. There is, I don't think there's any way of uh, completely substituting, uh, taking the human out of this uh, loop. And so think about uh, good tools that may help examiners do their work. So in order to develop these methods, we have to take uh, handwritten samples, somehow convert this handwriting into data, uh, define features here. Features might be, for example, the slant of writing that uh, can you be used to represent somebody's handwriting. And finally, uh, construct statistical models uh, that will allow us to answer either uh, the, the closed set question or the open set question. And what we are aiming for is an approach or approaches that are content independent and hopefully also language independent, although we haven't done any work in this regard yet. And that is robust to writing style. So that if you have somebody with very connected or you know cursive writing, very disconnected writing, the methods will not um, fail. Okay, so uh, there's 
this is one area where there's some actually um, pretty darn good databases that are available uh, to researchers. Um, and uh, we started collecting our own um, handwriting data, mostly because we wanted, uh, we wanted our database to have certain characteristics. At times, uh, at this moment, we have over 240 unique writers, but I think that by the end of the year, we'll probably hit 300 or so. Um, the most of what I'm going to show you today uh, was developed using the first 90 writers, but it's all illustration in any event. So uh, the the participants in our in our study uh, were uh, sent three prompts: the London letter, a subset of the a paragraph from the Wizard of Oz, and a short phrase. And they were asked to sit down and copy these three prompts in random order three times, and then repeat this twice more. So for each writer, we have 27 uh, samples of writing. Um, and uh, the, we sent them the, the paper we wanted them to use uh, and the pen we wanted them to use so that we could um, you know, forget about those other confounding factors. So um, the first step in our in our uh, pipeline is to convert handwriting into graphs, and we are not the first uh, group to think about this. Uh, there's many other um, uh, softwares, handwriting uh, analysis softwares that do something similar. Uh, there's Cedar Fox. There is Flash ID. Um, there is fish. Uh, and so uh, what we're doing here is not 100% novel. We just do it a little different. So um, Stephanie is going to demonstrate all of this, but you might start from a word like CSAFE that's uh, written in blue. Uh, the first step in the process after all the, uh, well, the first step in the process is to convert it to black and white. Uh, then we extract a skeleton, a one pixel wide skeleton of the word. And then following some rules that we came up with uh, and that handwriter implements, we uh, divide this word or any word into these graphical structures. And so there's a principal way to do this and every word is treated exactly the same way. And this is what you might end up with. And most of the graphs, so each one of these we call a graph. Uh, most of these graphs correspond to letters, but not always. So for example, the A here was broken into two graphs uh, that I'm showing you here. Uh, this is the data. These are the, the data units that we're going to be analyzing. Now, if you look at a document, uh, let's say like the London letter, and you decompose that document into graphs, you end up with a whole lot of graphs. So you end up maybe with like 400 graphs, um, more or less. And none of those graphs are identical. And so if I, if, you know, if somebody were to write C save many times, uh, the same person, this C would not be identical every time. And so when you apply this breaking rule, you might end up with graphs that sort of look like this, but not quite. And so they're not identical. And so the question is, can we, um, can we group these graphs into a smaller set of similar graphs with which we can then work? And here is uh, a hypothesis that uh, has uh, led some of our work. Um, if we find a way to separate graphs into different types, uh, the frequency with which an individual produces uh, graphs of different types is going to be informative. In other words, it's going to be characteristic of that individual's handwriting. And so the first question you ask is, what do we mean by types of graphs? Well, um, what we, this is one of the first things we did several years ago, is we proposed a method of to cluster graphs. This is um, uh, what we call a dynamic uh, clustering approach. It's called a k-means algorithm. And so uh, in our case, we choose a number k, uh, and then we ask a handwriter to allocate the graphs to these k groups. Uh, in some optimal way. And one 
a possibility is to minimize the difference uh, between graphs in a cluster uh, while maximizing the differences between clusters. So uh, it turns out that uh, clustering graphs is a little difficult. And so before we could apply this k-means algorithm, we had to define what we mean by distance between graphs. And also we need, needed to define what we mean by the center of each cluster. And uh, this was uh, both uh, Nick Berry and, and Amy Crawford uh, did, did this research as part of their uh, doctorate in statistics. So you know that this was not trivial, uh, but it turned out to be a really nice piece of work. So for example, if you take the London letter and you um, define K to be 40, let's so create 40 clusters, a handwriter may end up producing something that looks like this. And so here's 40 clusters. Think of them, each one of these squares is a cluster. Think of them as um, little buckets. And uh, the, red, uh, the red graph in each one of these buckets is the most representative exemplar. So this is the most representative graph. What do I mean by that? It's the one that's closest to all other graphs in that particular bucket. And so, and the, and the gray shadows here, this is all the other graphs that ended up in this particular bucket. And so you can see that in some buckets, uh, the graphs are all very similar. Like if I look at bucket E, they all seem to be very similar. There's very little shadowing here. But if I look at bucket, let's say P, uh, there's a lot of variability yeah? because there's lots of graphs that look uh, not that close to this exemplar that I'm showing you here. Anyway, so what do we do with this? Um, so here's the idea. Suppose that I have a set of training documents. So I have a very large sample of individuals that have uh, different writing styles and for whom I have several uh, uh, samples of writing. And uh, I process all of those training documents uh, using handwriter. What do I mean? I extract these graphs that I should, just showed you. Uh, I pick a number of clusters K. I, the example I, should, I showed you had 40 uh, clusters. And then uh, I create um, a template with the K bucket. So this is, this is my template. Now imagine now that I have this template and each template is represented by an exemplar, right? And so now I have a new document. And let's suppose that I take this new document. Uh, what I can do now is extract the graphs using handwriter and then I can take all those graphs that I have from my new document and distribute them in all these buckets and I'll put each graph into the best bucket, the one that fits that particular graph better. And so that's essentially what we do. We extract graphs from testing documents and we allocate those graphs to those buckets in the template. And then we count how many graphs each person contributed to each cluster. And the idea here is that the frequency with which a person contributes graphs to a cluster is informative. So if you look at my handwriting and your handwriting, we will have different numbers of graphs in each one of those 40 clusters, even if we copy the exact same document. So um, what we do then is we use these cluster frequencies as features uh, or variables. And so uh, what I'm showing you here is kind of, um, so in the X axis here, you have all the clusters, cluster one, two, three, all the way to 40. And then in the X axis, you have uh, the proportion of the graphs that each person um, country, the proportion of the graphs from a document written by a person that ended up in each one of the clusters. And you can see, and here we have three writers, writer 12, writer 66, and writer 100, which have different colors. And you can see that there's quite a difference, right? So cluster one, everybody more or less uh, has a little proportion of graphs in cluster one. 
But if you look, for example, at cluster, let's say 26 uh, or 27, uh, writer 66, the green writer, is way different from the other two writers. And if you look at uh, cluster 34, again, green, red, uh, blue, they're very different. By the time you take all these 40 frequencies together, you have some real information about the writing characteristics of each one of these people. Oh, I see a Q&A, let's see, Q&A. When analyzing an individual letter or graph, did you consider the impact of the preceding and subsequent letters on slant, et cetera? That's a really um, uh, good question. We didn't, um, but this is, um, this is really a, an excellent point that we should uh, look into, but the answer is no. All right, so, um, whoops, all right. We can extract, we can measure other things. So for example, uh, one of the things that, you know, uh, examiners look at the writing slant, for example, and they look at the areas of loops and the shapes of the loops uh, and so on. And so we can also look at some of those attributes. Uh, I'm showing you, for example, slant. And if you look at, these are graphs that were, um, these are graphs that were written, uh, whoops, sorry. What happened? Ah. These were graphs that were written um, by writer number one uh, in cluster 16. And you can see that we can characterize the slant of each graph. This is, uh, the way we compute this is by looking at, um, something called a principal component. And we look at the first, the angle between the first principal component and the horizontal. And uh, those angles represent the slant of the graphs. So if I look at this particular writer, cluster 16, all of the graphs that this uh, writer contributed to uh, this particular cluster, this is what those angles look like. And uh, to analyze these angles, we project them onto a, a complete circle, and, um, but that's just for statistical issues. But what I'm trying to say is that there's other things aside from the uh, frequency with which uh, writers produce different types of graphs that we can measure on the graphs themselves. All right, so, uh, the, so that's the data that we have to work with. And now let me go to the close set of writers situation. So this is just to remind you, we have N sub W potential writers of a question document. And uh, using handwriter, uh, we can extract graphs from the question document and from the writing samples of the potential writers. And the data that we have is um, for each writer and each document, the number of graphs in each of the K clusters uh, for the question document and for the samples uh, th that each potential writer has provided. And again, we might have other measurements like this angle that I was talking about. The question that we ask ourselves here is who among the N sub W potential writers is the most likely writer of the question document? And the way we have addressed this is we have been very classical statisticians here. We have fitted something called a hierarchical model from a Bayesian point of view. And this model computes the pro posterior probability of ridership for each of the N writers in the closed set. So the posterior probability of ridership of the question document for each of the N writers in the closed set. Now, those of you that have worked in the, um, in the likelihood ratio uh, approach and so on, know that this is not the question that the examiner should be asking himself or herself, right? So the examiner should be asking, what is the chance of observing this degree of similarity between these two documents if this particular writer wrote the document versus if this other particular writer wrote the document? Uh, and so what we're working here is the posterior probabilities of the hypothesis themselves that in general is a no-no. But this closed set of writers uh, is a special case. Uh, what we're doing over, because we know it can only be one from this group. And so the implicit assumption here is that unless we know something else, each writer has the same prior probability of writership. And so that's why we can come up with 
the posterior probability of ridership in this particular example. Uh, it turns out that the method is really good and we, um, we trained the, uh, so we used uh, the CSAFE data uh, to train um, the clustering approach to fit model parameters, but then uh, we have tested this approach, uh, incorporating data from many other sources, the CVL data set, the IAMS data set, and uh, we just uh, discovered a treasure trove of data uh, from the CEDAR uh, Institute website. So what you're looking at here is uh, just for fun, we had uh, 90 potential writers, and I think it was 90, well, a, a lot of potential writers in this group, and uh, a lot of um, question documents. What we did is we kept, uh, kept one document from each one of these writers and call that a uh, question document. And, the, and, the, and what we asked ourselves was, can we now associate each one of those documents that we pulled out uh, to the real writer? In this case, we knew uh, ground truth. And so anything that's on the diagonal here is the correct assignment. Uh, and what you see in the off diagonals are um, probabilities that are incorrect. So for example, um, this little square here represents the posterior probability that writer 133 wrote document 31, let's say. And we know that that's wrong because it was writer 31 that wrote document 31. Uh, but uh, we have an improved version of this model that uses the slant and so on, and the uh, accuracy is pretty high. So I am going to step aside and let um, Stephanie do a CSAFE demo. So here is the Handwriter app. This isn't on the web yet, but should be soon. Right now, if you want to access it, you can go to the CSAFE GitHub repo and download it. Um, so the first thing I'm going to show you is this tab allows you to explore the first part of what Alicia was talking about, about how Handwriter will decompose handwriting into component shapes, which we call graphs. So here we have a default image. You can also upload a different image um, if you want to play around with it. And then once you have the image that you want, you click process handwriting. And it'll take just a few seconds. And then you can see each stage that handwriter is going through this. So the first stage is that it converts the writing to true black and white. Then it will thin the image. So this is where it takes the image and makes all of the handwriting exactly one pixel wide. And then you can see uh, then the next step is it will apply the breaking rules to get the component shapes. And here we can see the nodes for where the endpoints of those shapes. So this tab right here isn't, um, it just gives you a good way to kind of see behind the hood of how Handwriter is processing a document. Okay, the next tab we have here, I won't spend too much time on, but this allows you, if you need to do any pre-processing to your handwritten documents, such as cropping or rotating, you can do that here. And then you can save um, the updated version of your image. And then once it's ready um, to use with handwriter, we can go to, so this tab is the workhorse of handwriter. So this will actually allow us to analyze question documents. So the first thing you do is you set up a directory on your computer um, that contains the question documents you want to identify a writer for, as well as um, the training documents that you want to use to fit a cluster or to make the clustering template and fit the model. Um, so here on my computer, just within my documents folder, I created a, um, a directory called shiny example. 
and I already put the question documents in there. So if you click over here on question documents tab, I can click on details. So this is telling me the file name of the question documents. So in this case, um, we actually know the ground truth for this experiment. So I know who actually wrote each of these documents. Um, of course, in practice, you wouldn't actually know who wrote it and that's just fine. Um, but for this example, I thought I'd show you um, how accurate we know the model to be. Um, all right, so there are the question documents. And the first thing you do, um, like what Alicia was talking about, is either you can create a new clustering template. Um, there is one default clustering template that you can use. Um, and then you can also, if you've already created a template and just want to load one, you can do that. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to load. It takes, um, depending on how many training documents you use, it um, takes a little bit of time to create a new template. So I won't create one live. I'm going to show you one that I've already created. So here I will select my template. And then here, this is going to give me more details about that template that I've loaded. This is going to tell me the names of the template training of the documents I used to train the template. And then it's going to give me a nice plot. So handwriter behind the scenes, it took each of these training documents. And like Alicia was talking about, it split all of that handwriting up into component graphs. And then it performed a k-means clustering algorithm to group the graphs into similar clusters. And then here is showing the cluster fill counts for each of the clusters in this template. So this is saying for the template training documents, how many training graphs showed up in each cluster. Um, and then negative one is an outlier cluster. So if there are graphs that look absolutely absolutely nothing like um, any of the other graphs, they get grouped into an outlier cluster. Um, and then here we can see, um, yeah, the number of graphs in each cluster. And as you can see, there are some graphs that are a lot more popular than other, or some clusters that are a lot more popular than others, which, I think could definitely be expected from handwriting. There are just some shapes that show up a lot more often than others. Uh, all right, so once you've chosen a clustering template, then the next thing that we can do is, oh, and then here, sorry, before I go on. Um, so this is just a placeholder for right now. What I'm working on is actually generating these new graphs um, every time you create a new clustering template template so that it'll actually show you the red would be the average graph for that cluster and then all the gray would be all the graphs in that cluster so that's coming soon okay so once you have a clustering template created or loaded the next thing that you do is you go to your model data so i'll click over here and these are all the documents i'm going to use to train the model and the first thing that we do is we're going to click this cluster assignments button and then we click get cluster assignments so what that would do is it would take it would process each of these handwriting samples get the component graphs and then assign those graphs to the closest cluster in the clustering template that we chose and this takes a few minutes so in interest of time i'm going to load the cluster assignments that i've already calculated so let me, sorry, I have to move my Zoom screen out of the way. Okay. Um, so here, I'm going to go in here. And then here, I'm going to load model clusters. These are ones that I created yesterday. And once they're loaded, then you can actually see the cluster fill counts for each writer and each document that we're going to use to train the model. Okay, so then this is the data, like Alicia talked about, that we're going to use to train the model. So then the next thing that we can do is we can actually fit the model. So this number of iterations is how many MCMC iterations you want to run for the model. Um, 
I know that term might not mean a lot to people on this uh, webinar. We'll have more information about more of the details about the model if you're interested in digging into it more. Um, and then we would click fit model. Again, in interest of time, I'm going to load a model that I already fit. And then, oh no, oh, so embarrassing. Okay, sorry. <laughs> This is still clearly a work in progress. Okay. I'm going to. Oh my goodness. I, I, I tested this three times this morning, and of course it worked fine. And then now, so. Of course it doesn't. All right. So sorry about that. Oh my goodness. Okay. So we're going to restart things and then hope that now it will let me do it. Okay. I'm going to move that out of my way. So I'm going to go back to where were we? We were on the model tab. We're going to, okay, so load model clusters. And then we're going to fit a model. And, or sorry, load a model. Oh, no. Okay. There's another way I can go about it. Um, yeah. Goodness. Okay, let's see here. So, okay, we're going to go back here. And I am so sorry. We will figure out what is going wrong and fix that so that when you, <laughs> if you want to use it, that you will hopefully not run into any of these issues <laughs> that I'm currently running into. Okay. So I'm going to fit the model. So instead of trying to load one, I'm going to fit one. Um, okay. And then, so, and if you're familiar with Bayesian statistics, we do have some model diagnostic tools built in here. So you can see what's called a trace plot. Um, I won't like I said, we'll have training materials that will talk more about all of these details. For right now, I'll talk more about what people are probably the most excited about is analyzing those question documents. So here, um, again, these are the question documents. In this case, I know the ground truth, but these would be the documents that you want to calculate the uh, probability of ridership from. So again, you would click cluster assignments. Um, and um, to process this handwriting and assign each of the graphs from each of these documents into um, the closest cluster in the cluster template. And again, in interest of time, I'm gonna load what I already had here, um, or sorry, what I've already, I had already gotten the cluster assignments for this ahead of time. And then here, this is going to show you the cluster fill counts for my five question documents. So how many graphs from each document show up in each cluster. And then now, of course, the most exciting part is now we have all the pieces in place. We have the model, we have um, processed our question documents. Now we can actually analyze the documents. So this number of cores here is just um, telling the app, how many cores you want to use for parallel processing. Um, we're going to click analyze documents and that part is pretty fast. And then here we have our table of the posterior probabilities of ridership that Alicia was talking about. So in this case, because I know the ground truth, I know that this first question document was written by writer nine and the model is actually assigning 100% of the posterior probability of ridership to rider nine. So for this second document, it's giving a posterior probability of 99% to rider 30, which we know actually is the rider. And it's giving 1% to rider 203. And so you can see it's giving a posterior probability of ridership for each document and each of these known riders in our closed set. Um, so this is giving us the exact number, and if you, then we also visualize it by showing 
a plot. So again, this is showing the posterior probability of ridership for each of our question documents is um, a row, and then each of the known writers is a column. And then the color indicates the posterior probability. So as you can see, even for this tiny model that um, I didn't use a whole lot of training documents for, and I didn't use a whole lot of, um, uh, yeah, I didn't use a whole lot of training documents for to make things go quickly. Um, for this demo, you see it actually did really well. It I correctly identified all five writers of the documents. So, nice. Thank you, Stephanie. <laughs> It's inevitable that when you have a demonstration, something goes belly up, I think. I am so yeah. sorry. I tested it <laughs> so much. And I'm like, okay, I got things that work. No, no. So sorry, yeah. everyone. I mean, we're not claiming that anything is ready for, uh, you know, for the big time anyway. So let me pick up where um, where Stephanie left. So the, the, the goal for Handwriter, of course, is um, to clear all the bugs, uh, have a nice user interface at some point. There's a whole lot of things that Handwriter produces that uh, you probably are not interested in seeing. So there's, a, there's some work to be done, but um, it's, uh, it's doing pretty well. And uh, we've been spending a lot of time uh, cleaning up the code and putting it in a presentable way so that people can start playing with it. And somebody asked whether it was going to be sold. No, we um, at CSAFE produce everything. Um, everything that we produce goes into the public domain. So uh, when we have a finalized version of a handwriter, anybody that wishes to use it can use it. And um, these temporary versions are already being um, uh, loaded into this GitHub repository that CSAFE uses. Um, so this is mostly, as I say, I'm going to be talking mostly about Danica's work and some of her students' work. So suppose that you have a uh, situation where you have a question document, you have a suspect, and you ask, um, is the suspect the author of this question document, or is somebody else the author of the question document? Or uh, you could have, for example, um, two question documents of unknown provenance, and you could ask, uh, were these two documents written by the same individual or uh, were they uh, written by different individuals? So uh, suppose, and this is not an open set question. And so the methods that we just talked about, uh, a closed set question. And so the methods we talked about um, are, could be applied, but it's really uh, clunky. And so there's better ways of addressing this problem. And that is by looking at some sort of likelihood ratio approach. And so suppose that you have um, a document E sub X and a document E sub Y, this is your evidential um, samples. And let's suppose that X is the features you extracted from E sub X and Y are the features you extracted from E sub Y. Uh, you can compute a likelihood ratio and this is a definition of the likelihood ratio as follows. In the numerator you have the probability of observing the features I have observed, X and Y, if uh, the prosecution's hypothesis is true, and then divided by the probability of observing the features I have observed, if the defense's hypothesis is true. And to give you some sort of a toehold into what we were talking about earlier, the features X, for example, could be the, the frequencies with which um, the free, you could take this document E sub X, extract the clusters, extract the graphs, cluster the graphs, and then count how many graphs are in each one of the clusters. And that would be your X. And then you could take this other document E sub Y, again, extract the graphs, cluster those graphs, and again, count how many graphs you find in each one uh, of those clusters, and that would be your Y. And so if we have 40 clusters, this X here has 40 elements, it's a vector with 40 elements, and this Y here would be a vector with 40 elements. And so uh, imagine, um, so you have a 40, so this is a problem, right? Because 40 is a lot of, uh, of observations or of features. And so computing this probability of 
you know, observing this 40 X's together with this 40 Y's under the two competing hypotheses gets really cumbersome. Uh, and so um, one possibility is to see whether you can take this X vector and this Y vector and somehow summarize what you're seeing in some way. So what Madeline Johnson and uh, Danica proposed was the following. Suppose that I take the X and the Y and I construct the difference between those two element by element. So uh, I construct a new vector delta. The first element in delta is the difference between uh, the number of graphs in the first element in X minus the first element in Y and so on and so forth. And so this delta here, again, has K elements and it's just differences. Instead of being the original features, it's the differences. Um, so if e, intuitively, if these two documents were written by the same person, you would expect that all those K differences would be small, right? In fact, ideally they would be zero. And if the X, EX and EY were written by different people, you would expect those differences to be larger. So uh, you still have the problem that you have 40 differences to worry about, but it turns out that uh, there's many different statistical ways of combining those uh, K features into a single similarity score. And uh, one possible way is by using uh, a method called a random forest. Uh, there's many other possible methods. And what you end up with is a single similarity score, one number, Let's call that capital delta. And so what you now do instead of, oh, shoot, I should have had an S here. Instead of computing a likelihood ratio, you compute what's called a score-based likelihood ratio. And the score-based likelihood ratio has the same shape as the likelihood ratio. And essentially the numerator is what's the probability of observing this particular value of the similarity score if the prosecution is right, divided by the probability of observing this particular value of the similarity score if the defense is right. And so um, this is a this is a plot from Madeline's paper. Uh, what you see here in the on the left is uh, the 40 clusters. And then um, you have the uh, cluster pro the differences between the clusters frequencies. And the, the, the pairs uh, that uh, you're looking at, so to, in order to compute those differences, of course, you have to create these pairs of documents. Uh, the differences uh, that were computed for pairs of documents written by the same individual, as it was in orange, and the differences between uh, the frequencies uh, computed from pairs of documents that were written by different individuals are these ones, the turquoise ones. And as you would expect, uh, the differences are much smaller, the, the orange peaks are much lower than the, um, than the turquoise peaks. And in fact, the, the, it looks like there's quite a separation, if you will. And so what we have in the right, so this is for the 40 differences, what we have in the right is the observed values of that score that I was telling you about, that delta, the combination of all of those differences uh, among non-matching um, non -matching documents. This is what you have in the teal here in the blue and among matching documents. So essentially what this is, is a dissimilarity score because you're looking at differences. The bigger the difference is, uh, the more likely it is that the two documents were written by different people. The smaller the difference is, the more likely it is that the two documents were written by the same person. And what do I mean by likely? I mean uh, the height of these two distributions. So for example, the value here, 0.3, is very likely uh, because this is very high here. If the two documents were written by the same person, it's very unlikely because this distribution is very low here if the two documents were written by different people. And so this is very, really promising because there's a lot of separation between these two distributions of this similarity scores. And so it seems that it is possible to distinguish um, or to classify correctly 
uh, documents that have a common source and documents that have a different source. All right. There's many issues with uh, uh, score-based likelihood ratios. They're really a nice approach. They're very practical. They can be applied when uh, a, a standard likelihood ratio approach cannot be uh, applied. But there's a few technical details that uh, one needs to be aware of. And by one, I mean us statisticians uh, that uh, we need to make sure we know how to deal with. Um, the first one is that um, constructing the pairs for non-matching documents or documents written by different people is pretty tricky. What do we mean by non-matching? Do we mean um, to any other two individuals from the population? Do we mean uh, any other two individuals uh, that have the same type of writing? I mean, this how we define this uh, non-matching population or is, is going to affect how we compute that uh, score-based likelihood ratio. There's, uh, lots of, um, there's a lot of research in this area. And uh, the other problem is that when we construct these pairs of documents to uh, compute the dissimilarity score, like I just showed you, uh, what we are doing is we're creating dependence among the observations because um, the same document is going to appear in various pairs. And why do we worry about that? But because in statistics, dependence among observations tends to increase the uncertainty that is associated with statistical methods. So your margins of errors uh, get bigger. And so um, where does this dependence come from? Oh, shoot, I should finish, right? Um, let me forget about it. So this brings me to the last thing I wanted to talk about, which is uh, Federico Veneri's uh, PhD research. So this is, uh, so Federico has been thinking about this dependence and coming up with a principal way of constructing independent subsamples of items where each source is represented exactly one in, uh, in exactly in one pair. And so here you start, for example, with 10 sources or 10 writers. Uh, for each one, we have five documents and each source is color coded here. And so you see eight, 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 and there's another eight. So there's five, eight corresponding to writer eight. And if you construct all pairs, all possible pairs between all of these documents, you end up with 1,225 possible pairs. And each one of these documents appears in many pairs. And so uh, what Federico has come up with is an approach to, that he calls strong source subsampling, uh, which creates uh, subsets of the documents that are independent. Um, and so there's many different ways, no, there's many different possibilities. So, so what there's, you know, depending on where you start, you end up with a different uh, subsample. And so one question uh, that uh, Federico and Danica asked themselves is, you know, when creating the subsamples, the problem is that you lose a lot of the uh, data because you uh, keep a small uh, subset of the pairs. And so what if we took all possible strong subsamples on each one uh, fit some sort of a score likelihood ratio and then combine those likelihood ratios into one final likelihood ratio. That's what's called an ensemble. And uh, Federico calls this an ESLR uh, because it's a combination of a bunch of base SLRs, each one computed from one of these subsamples of the data. And the question is, does it improve performance? And, I am the, and so here the, the question is define performance. And so there's many different ways in which you could measure performance. Uh, one way is to look at the rate of, uh, or the discriminatory power, uh, which uh, do you get really large likelihood ratios when um, you know that the when ground truth is non-matching and really low likelihood ratios when ground truth is matching. And it turns out that um, the ensemble methods, which are the ones I'm showing you on the bottom, really do much better than the SLR at the top here computed from a single data set with dependencies. 
and from other variations here. So again, this is a, a scratch at the surface of what's going on here, but uh, just to give you an introduction of, of what, what this ensembling uh, stands for. So to finish, um, there's, these are just a few of the projects. We have any number of other projects that are ongoing. Uh, we're working on a Siamese neural network to extract features and compare two documents in tandem. This is Andrew Lim. Um, we continue work on the, working on the Kinesia triangulation of words. Uh, this is Alexandria Arabio, a comparison of handwriter with flash ID, and Stefan is working on that. Um, principal approaches of selecting clusters. So, you know, lots of what we do depends on these clusters that we defined at the very beginning. How do we define, how do we select the scale? Um, we're looking at the analysis of signatures using kinetic variables extracted with the mobilizers. This is Emily Allen. And uh, we thank Clinton Mohammed for sending us some excellent data. And then uh, Anisha, another one of our students, is looking into base factors to quantify uh, the weight of evidence in handwriting, uh, evidence in an open set. <sighs> so, <laughs> Thank you so very much. Uh, visit our website. Uh, feel free to contact any of us. I just put my email address there, but Danica is DM Omen. Uh, she'd be happy to hear from you. Stephanie would be happy to hear from you. Uh, Reinders, we are all at iastate.edu. Are there any questions? There are. How do you discriminate individualizing attributes versus class characteristics? Well, we don't really. Um, the, at this moment, we're not looking at that. I, I suppose that um, it might be interesting to discriminate. Let's suppose that a class characteristic would be um, the connectedness of the writing. So uh, if I am trying to uh, construct a set of close non-matches for some document uh, where the writing is highly connected, I might use that information to construct a set of close non-matches by looking at uh, other documents from the database that also have highly connected writing. Uh, Danica, you want to answer this? Go for it. Oh, no, you're doing fine. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I mean, basically, uh, you're right. We don't. We don't look at that. No. Uh, so at this moment, we're not looking at it. We might. Uh, did you monitor any tiring effects, intra writer variability over time? Um, so the way, no, uh, but maybe that's because we didn't um, set out to do that. Um, the way we collected this data is, uh, as I mentioned, three repetitions. Uh, of the same three prompts uh, in random order, but we didn't ask people to sit down and do it uh, in one sitting. So uh, we sent this material to participants and they could you know, do part of it today and the other part tomorrow. And, um, and so we don't have any way of looking at that with our data. And you come, Tay says, can handwriter analyze signatures? Uh, not at this moment, but this is one of the things we're hoping to incorporate into handwriter. What happens if the analyzed text has an intersection with other text of an overlying line or of another writer? Ah, um, so if you have, uh, so that's one of the things that you try to resolve uh, when you're pre-processing the the writing samples. Um, sometimes, you know, we've been suffering right now with some of the signature data because they have they've been uh, written on a on a on a line, and the the signature intersects many of these signatures intersect this line, and it gets harder to uh, pre-process and extract what you really want from those. And so, I don't have an answer. Danica, do you have an answer for that? Nope, other than you can either, you know, resolve that, like you said, during pre-processing, get rid of the overlapping text or, um, 
or handwriter won't do what you want it to. Yeah, it's a problem. Yes, in developing your sample group, was it predominantly American writers? Um, so the sample that with the 240 writers that we have, I'm mostly uh, recruited from the United States, but many of them are foreign born. And so, you know, there's me, for example, I'm, I'm foreign born and we have lots of um, individuals of uh, Indian uh, descent or Chinese or European. And so it's a mix. It's mostly uh, American. Um, it's majority American, but there's, there's um, individuals from other um, individuals who got their uh, elementary uh, education elsewhere. Predominantly American writing system. What do you mean, Janine or Jenny? By uh, basic writing system. You mean, hmm, I don't know that I understand the question. Danica, can you see the question? I think they must be thinking like, um, you know, the copy book style, what style were you taught? Um, and so the one that's what we try to get at with that question of where did you get your third grade education because that would tell you sort of what copy book style. Mm. Um, so that's we um, have several different locations or regions for that third grade education, so we do have some people that were not in the American copy book style. Yeah. Uh, Alicia and Stephanie and, and Danica as well, I want to thank you all for presenting for the demo, for answering questions behind the scenes as well. Thank you all for joining us. We hope you have a great day.